Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started, everybody? Uh, so welcome. This session will explore accessibility policy implications related to XR based on recent finding and research reports and the role that industry and government can play in ensuring access. We'd like this to be as much of a conversation as possible. So we encourage full participation. Um, you know, please raise your hand if you have um, a, a question we would like to speak. Uh, you're welcome to turn on your camera and speak directly um, once you've got the go ahead. And we'll also be taking questions in the Slack. The Slack channel for this session is deep dive a two dash policy. Uh, so I'm joined today by Joan O'Hara and Miranda Lutz of the XR Association and John Shrushian of the Bipartisan Policy Center. To kick things off in 2021, the Bipartisan Policy uh, Center and the XRA Association partnered on an 18 month project with diverse collaborators to, to consider the promise of virtual, augmented and mixed reality as well as immersive technologies not yet invented. They recently published a report with the results. So John, Joan and Miranda, please tell us about how and why you created this report and why this community should be interested. Um, all right, I'll go first. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, Thank you, Jen. Yeah, of course. So uh, XRA reached out to BPC to um, talk about this collaboration because we were starting to think ahead of uh, policy implications from the technology. And um, although, I mean, it's still an ASEAN technology, but even two years ago, it was even more so. Uh, and, and while industry was working hard to develop the technology and had um, already started to invest literally billions of dollars in it, um, thought leaders and lawmakers and policymakers uh, were not well-versed at all in XR technology. So we wanted to start to get ahead of uh, what the policy challenges would be, um, what questions lawmakers would be asked really to address in the coming years and to start to unpack that and, uh, and provide you know, a roadmap for them, um, things to think about and also some suggested solutions to those problems. So really it was, um, we, we were trying to get ahead of things and be forward leaning in, in the approach to policy. So. Uh, that's why XRA was interested in doing this, and I'll uh, turn it over to John to talk about BPC's perspective. Great. Thanks, John. Yeah, so uh, BPC was uh, entered into the tech space when we were doing a project actually on artificial intelligence, where we're working with two members of Congress to help put together a series of reports that became a basis for a uh, national strategy for Congress uh, that uh, sort of became a house resolution that passed in 2020. While we were working on that project, we engaged a diversity of uh, stakeholder groups, experts to understand the issues, to help put these reports in place. Uh, and while we were doing this artificial intelligence project, we got noticed by uh, people in other uh, areas of technology, such as XR. And that's when uh, Joan and the XR Association reached out to us to try to do something similar. Uh, for virtual augmented mixed reality uh, without Congress yet being involved because the technology is in much earlier stages relative to AI, at least in this iteration. Uh, so we thought, amazing, this, this is exciting. This uh, you know emerging technology with a lot of uh, potential applications and even existing applications, a lot of interesting policy challenges uh, that we think we should uh, tackle. So we said yes and uh, we got to work. Uh, and one of the first things we tried to do is we tried to, tried to identify the various stakeholder groups, uh, including people in the accessibility community, uh, to really get a diverse range of perspectives on one, the issues that needed to be explored, uh, and two, potential solutions, areas of debate and uh, discussion uh, that we thought we should get ahead of right now before they become a broader uh, issue long-term. Uh, addressing issues early on, I think, often can help both uh, maximize the benefits and opportunities of a new technology while tackling and minimizing any uh, challenges and harms uh, in this space. So this effort then resulted in a series of, uh, I believe it was, <clears throat> sorry, um, four convenings, 
uh, three public events, a series of external collateral to try to sort of summarize our findings, what we've learned, and it all culminated with a report uh, and a public event where we released the report uh, summarizing our main findings. And if you're interested in uh, learning more about uh, the work directly by looking at these uh, documents, just go to bipartisanpolicy.org under the technology section, uh, you should be able to find it. Uh, so that's kind of how we got into this space. I'm happy to talk more about some of the findings in the report, Corinne, if you want right now, or we could save that for uh, uh, the latter questions. Yeah, I think jumping into the findings now would be great. Um, great. Yeah. All right. So uh, when we started writing about uh, or learning about uh, XR, we were not as familiar with many of the applications, uh, nor many of the challenges. And we thought there'd be a lot of overlaps with challenges of existing uh, technologies like AI or the internet as we know it. Um, we thought there'd be some stuff that was either unique or a like, significant evolution of an existing challenge. So in a report, one of the first things we looked at was the applications and growth of the technology. Uh, and we tried to make a big point that it's not just for gaming and entertainment, as uh, many sort of seem to assume uh, virtual and augmented reality are about. Uh, there are many applications in the healthcare space, education, workforce training, manufacturing, retail, you name it. Uh, so that was a point we kind of want to emphasize, because uh, with policymakers, often you get their attention when they realize the variety of industries uh, it's being used for. And we thought that was an important point to emphasize uh, in the report. Because if you're talking about gaming and entertainment issues, people don't think of it as much. But when you're talking about a variety of uh, industries where people have you know, uh, their jobs and get their products and services from, they start to pay more attention. So one of our initial findings was this technology has been uh, growing, it's continuing to grow, and it's going to have a diverse range of uh, applications. Uh, beyond that, we tried to identify several issues uh, that we thought were very important. A uh, pro project like this, it's near impossible to get everything. So we tried to get a few of the main points that people kept bringing up uh, on a recurring basis. Uh, the six that we talk about in the report are privacy, security, economic issues, uh, access and adoption, equity and inclusion, and safety. Uh, so we go through all six of those. And a few points we make on those is, one, a lot of these issues are interconnected. Uh, so privacy issues and security issues often go hand in hand. A person's uh, privacy protections can also have equity and inclusion perspectives. Uh, oftentimes, marginalized communities are the ones that uh, most need to protect uh, privacy in certain areas, protect certain types of data. Uh, so that, that was a key finding when it came to these issues. Uh, also, we discussed trade-offs. Uh, sometimes there are trade-offs that need to be well understood. Uh, so privacy protections uh, for you know, marginalized communities are often great for equity inclusion uh, reasons, uh, but sometimes privacy protections uh, may also mean privacy for someone who's bullying a uh, certain person in a marginalized community. Mm -hmm. And in terms of moderating sort of activity online, th those are tricky questions uh, that need to be addressed, uh, trying to find win-wins when possible, but also trying to figure out where there are trade-offs, uh, where these different issues uh, may sort of uh, come into conflict with each other. Uh, so we thought that was a very important uh, aspect of uh, what we learned. A few other big points. Uh, we tried to find uh, solutions for these various areas, or at least identify trade-offs uh, when uh, possible. Uh, we did not make too many direct recommendations, uh, given some of these we're still trying to figure out and we're trying to start a conversation on these topics. A point that I think was uh, universally agreed upon and very important, though, uh, is that when designing, developing, deploying, building policy around standards around these technologies, uh, it's very important to have a diversity of viewpoints and backgrounds represented uh, in a very meaningful way. Uh, you know, uh, people with disabilities, uh, other marginalized communities, uh, you know, different uh, people of different backgrounds, ages, you know, race, gender, uh, it's very important to get everyone meaningfully involved. And that was something I think there was a universal consensus now how to get there. 
Uh, that can be uh, tricky at times, but we thought that was very important. Uh, we also, another finding we had was the need to review existing laws and policies uh, to find out where there are gaps, uh, what may need to be modernized, uh, what can be tailored, what needs to just be interpreted correctly, either by the courts or some other body uh, to figure out what we have and where we can build off of or what, what we need to change. Uh, in addition to that, we think the role of standards is very important, uh, best practices, uh, guidelines, frameworks. Uh, oftentimes, laws and regulations can be uh, slow to adopt to emerging technology, uh, while standards, best practices, frameworks often don't have the full force of government enforcement behind them. They can often be more nimble uh, and sometimes even complement uh, government policies. Uh, so we thought that was a very important uh, issue to raise in our report. Another big issue was the interaction of different technologies. So if you think of just XR technologies in a vacuum, you're not getting the full diversity of uh, you know, the uh, challenges and opportunities out there because XR technologies will interact with other technologies, whether it's AI, neural technology, uh, robotics, you name it. Uh, so we think it's important to think of these technologies in terms of their interactions with other uh, technologies and uh, be mindful of you know how AI might affect uh, activity in a virtual community. Uh, and then uh, finally, we thought it was very important uh, for there to be meaningful discussion on this topic beyond just the experts, uh, but also to involve the broader public uh, because to get meaningful input uh, to policymakers, uh, we need people who will be affected by this technology, uh, even those who won't use the technology directly but indirectly impacted. So someone who may be reported with uh, AR glasses uh, is someone who is uh, definitely impacted and important to get input from. Uh, but we think in order to get meaningful input to policymakers, uh, we need to better inform the public about these technologies as they come out, a lot of the issues that will be raised. Uh, without being overly utopian or dystopian, but getting some of the facts out there so they can sort of uh, form their own opinion, bring up their concerns and the opportunities that they see. Uh, and we think the media, uh, think tanks, uh, academic experts and other people uh, who better understand the technology should uh, feel a certain responsibility to make sure the public uh, learns about the issues in an honest and transparent manner. Fantastic. Um, so we've are, we are starting to receive questions. And so one uh, area that I think we can kick things off with is the digital divide and the issues around that that the question of immersive technology raises. Uh, Larry Goldberg asks, and Larry, you're welcome to come off mute to talk directly, but he says XRA, BPC, ITIF, and XR Access have conducted excellent and thorough research and have come up with important findings, including issues related to inclusivity and accessibility. So the what has been identified, but the how seems to be missing. With massive funding set aside for U USICA and broadband subsidies, I don't see any requirements including, included that require that dollars granted must include full accessibility. How do you suggest we embed accessibility requirements in federal subsidies? Well, that's my question. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering if the reports, which are really quite excellent from XRA and uh, Bipartisan Center and others, actually conclude with a roadmap that says, therefore, these are the actions that need to be taken because we believe strongly that the outreach has been excellent. And the uh, input from a wide group and diverse communities have been taken into account. Now what? Um, <clears throat> well, I'll let others comment as well, but I, I and this is not um, a, really a direct answer to your question, but part of what we um, are trying to do, as John mentioned, is educate lawmakers and help them to understand what this technology is and its potential um, in a variety of industries and also with issues like accessibility, how it can help um, the disabled community to have opportunities um, that they might not otherwise have. 
Um, something that we were really pleased with and proud of was our effort to get immersive technologies included in USICA and the American Competes Act. And while that doesn't specify uh, how, how the dollars would be allotted, um, having immersive technologies included in that list of those key emerging technologies was a big win for the industry. Um, it, it sort of plants a flag um, and indicates that Congress takes this issue, this technology seriously, uh, and is willing to invest in it as a priority technology. So while that's not, like I said, it's not a direct answer to your question, it's a first step. Um, and it was a big one for us. So I think you know, continued conversations and working with lawmakers and other advocacy groups to figure out the best way forward here is probably the next step for us. Yeah, I'll add a few uh, thoughts to it. Uh, so getting Congress to allocate funding uh, to an issue, it's difficult uh, because, you know, uh, there's a budget that they're trying to sort of like divvy up based on sort of different political constituencies uh, that have influence, you know, in the uh, policy making process. Uh, so that's a tricky issue where different advocacy groups uh, have to get involved and sort of put pressure on members. Uh, so in some cases, it's a question of how do you put adequate pressure while being mindful of uh, what the sort of right approach is. Uh, to spending uh, the money. Uh, I, and this is my experience with certain uh, people on Capitol Hill, uh, when it comes to something like virtual reality, augmented reality, people often, again, there's this stereotype that it's just for gaming and entertainment. Uh, they don't see uh, the use cases broadly in areas like education, workforce training, uh, healthcare, uh, manufacturing, you, you name it. Uh, and I think what often changes people, like makes them do a 180 is when they learn about these specific applications and see a lot of like, uh, you know, value in it. Uh, when it comes to accessibility issues and uh, people with disabilities, uh, I think showing the benefits uh, such technology can have and linking it to certain things like infrastructure spend uh is very important mm -hmm. uh and getting the right media angle uh i think is important to cover some of the success stories uh because that often drives uh, members i think sometimes it's a political pressure issue sometimes it's an information uh, gap or information asymmetry that it has to be bridged uh, I, I hope that's helpful larry and happy to elaborate more oh. your, your, your thoughts maybe what's You've seen. I think uh, it was a big win to get virtual reality included and mentioned. Um, I don't know that it's really a question of additional funding as opposed to the strings attached. Should you get such funding as a manufacturer, as an industry? You know, XRA has a wonderful membership. If they uh, recognize the success of getting uh, this technology built into the thinking of Congress, then to step forward and say, and by the way, if funding does come through, uh, no additional funds are needed. We just pledge that with other requirements, such as, I assume, privacy and security and U.S. manufacturing will be included as requirements. Accessibility should be as well um, as part of the requirements. We can't rely on existing laws like Section 508 or the ADA to force that. And I think in many ways, industry and, of course, advocates without question uh, need to step forward because Congress often will follow. Maybe by four or five steps, they will have to follow. But if no additional cost involved, then it just becomes one of the requirements. And I think that that then goes to, it's not just educating lawmakers, but it's also educating stakeholders at the various government agencies that will be writing the implementing regulations for how this money um, is to be spent. So there's certainly lots of touch points where um, education campaigns should be should be rolled out. Fair point, and I think we're gonna learn more from you guys uh, in a lot of cases than uh, you will from us. So thank you for that for that input. Uh, just a, one final point on that. Um, we, we've been talking to lawmakers about 
the benefits of XR technology for accessibility. Um, and we actually uh, have worked with Representative Langevin's office. He's the chair of the Disabilities Caucus in the House. And he, um, we brought him in as a speaker actually to, to meet with the, the XRA members. So again, you know, there's a lot more to it in terms of getting the dollars allocated and making accessibility a requirement. But, um, but education is a very important part of this as well to get lawmakers to advocate among their colleagues. Fantastic. Scott, I see that you have a question. Yeah, um, and sorry, I'm trying to get connected to the Slack channel. I'm on a different computer because- <laughs> No worries. Like, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't get Zoom to go on my work computer as well. Uh, so um, I, I was just wondering whether these these reports uh, and other, and by the way, this is all excellent, by the way, I'm, I'm loving the, the broad swath in terms of like the report, in terms of the different considerations, it, it all is very well aligned. Um, had, did it consider the role of, uh, and stop me if this already came up previously, like like state and local policy to help drive this too, in terms of like, uh, you know, state workforces. I mean, there's a lot of aspects I think where it could be complementary, I think on the state local level in addition to, to federal policy. Was that an emphasis, for instance, in that report that was mentioned at the beginning of the deep five in terms of those six areas, et cetera, and, and what could be helpful for policymakers or was that mostly considering just uh, federal policy? Yeah, I can jump in on that. Uh, so state and local was not a primary focus, uh, but we do reference uh, state and local because oftentimes state and local drives uh, federal policy. One, two, it serves as a model uh, for federal policy. So what people are doing on biometrics uh, in Illinois, I think has driven a lot of the discussion around biometrics uh, at the federal level, or sort of the California uh, consumer, uh, the CCPA, I forget what it stands for in California, um, privacy. Uh, so we think uh, those things are driving federal policy and are serving a guide for what works, what doesn't work, what are issues that people uh, care about. Uh, just, just to piggyback off that point, uh, also looking at what's going abroad uh, in Europe and other countries, I think is uh, pretty important. Again, we don't emphasize these, but we do uh, reference them when we talk about sort of uh, existing policies and policy gaps, uh, because we think it's important. If the federal government isn't going to sort of take the lead, oftentimes states uh, try to fill in the hole. And I think it's important to look at uh, all those areas. Let's see if Joan or Rand have anything to add. Great. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Please add if other folks have to add to that. My question. Thanks. I no, I agree with everything that John said, and uh, you know, a, a lot of times state regulations and laws will start to drive federal policy. Um, so we recognize that and we track that. Uh, with XRA, I'm, we we just simply don't have the bandwidth to do a lot of work at the state level because you're you're looking at the entire policy team here, <laughs> myself and Miranda. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, someday, hopefully, as XRA continues to grow, we will have a, a larger army. Um, so, but at this point, we, we can't do a lot of lobbying or anything at the state level, but we certainly do follow what's happening there as sort of a harbinger of what might be coming on the federal level. Scott, can, can, can I ask, are there any interesting uh, state or local uh, policies or policy debates that you uh, want to highlight for us? Yeah, and, and I should also highlight that we have an initiative for state local policies called SEED at the Office of Disability Employment Policy at ODEP. Uh, so uh, it, it, the state has changed on employment and disability. Um, I can, I don't know, if I get it connected to the Slack, I might be able to add, I don't know whether uh, uh, what my colleagues here from Wheelhouse uh, have the link for SEED as far as it's the policy, state sure. policy page off ODEP site. But the, um, there's different emphasis on employment and different aspects as far as like apprenticeship and some of these other areas that intersect. And, and I think that tech could potentially come up there too. So I don't know if that sort of helps too, to give a little bit of layout of the land that we're interested in that in terms of, for us though, it's always like, oh, these things would be helpful from a collaborative thing. Like we don't force things onto states and localities, right? Like we're not the federal government coming in and be like, states have to do this, but it's sort of, we've tried to help shape at times uh, collaboration through a framework from 2016 called Work Matters Report that has helped the SEED team, uh, which is run by concepts in collaboration with 
uh, ODEP for our seed project to help shape state and local policy. Um, and I think I'll have to connect with folks afterwards. I think tech stuff has sometimes come up as far as emerging accessible tech and the crossover with the workplace. I don't know if that, does that help give you a little bit of a flavor too for our interest on this space? And then I would say yeah. some of our other teams are also focused on this beyond seed too is like, 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 for us on, on our team employment related supports and like our youth team, for instance, or workforce systems team, like have had an interest on that state local policy and, and, and the cross connection on employment workforce development and some of these broader kind of issues, including on, on tech change. Yeah, that, that's, that's very helpful. And in fact, since you uh, put it that way, yeah, we, we have looked at state and local uh, initiatives on workforce training because uh, states are often the uh, what's called laboratories of democracy. So you see some interesting uh, work being done at that space. And the ones that work well, you know, we, we should look into sort of scaling and uh, adopting at a more national level. Fantastic. Uh, well, I'd love to, yeah, we can uh, continue on with the questions we're receiving from the group. And just again, a reminder to participants, um, we really welcome questions. Uh, we'd actively like to focus on the topics and issues that you want to hear about. So you can indicate that you want to uh, raise a question or issue by using the reaction, uh, raise hand action on this Zoom, uh, which is on the menu bar. You can post the question in the Slack channel. And if easier, you're also welcome to um, you know, start your video and indicate visually that you have a question. Um, so, um, so I'd love to uh, raise the question raised by Ed Shea. Uh, given that XR accessibility will require consensus from a large number of elected officials, what key messages are being shared about how XR accessibility helps businesses and the general public? And Ed, you're welcome to come off mute to, uh, you know, talk to us <laughs> um, yeah, as, as well. Yeah. Um, you, you said it so well. Um, I, I'm just kind of curious about uh, those key messages being really important uh, because you're trying to get consensus for people to, to say that this doesn't only benefit uh, those who need more inclusive technologies, but it, but it benefits everybody. Um, I think that like potentially put some positioning around like how to a certain extent, everybody has some form of disability either later in their life or they have something like kind of earlier in their life if they're younger, um, I think might be a way of positioning it so that it's not just, oh, oh, those specific individuals. It's like we've seen so much research out there that like you do one thing that helps a few people and then it helps everybody. Like touch screens may have helped a few people uh, access computers, but it's made computing more accessible to everyone, uh, something like that. I don't know. <laughs> uh, we we often talk about um, XR being a benefit to people of all abilities. Um, and that, that's kind of how we frame it. And it's very much what you just said, that uh, a lot of technology advancements that help people with various disabilities help everyone. Um, and also, as you mentioned, you might not have been born with a disability, uh, but you could develop one um, as people age, they have limitations. And then, you know, there are the cases where people might have some kind of an injury, uh, which will not be permanent, but for a while they're, they're essentially dealing with a disability. So um, I think the key is thinking about um, accessibility by design so that people of all abilities can take advantage of the technology. Um, but there are, I mean, you're, you're probably aware of this, but there are really miraculous developments out there um, that are in, in some in beta stage, but uh, being developed, for example, um, there's a, are you familiar with Cognition? Uh, th there's a company called Cognition that's working on um, technology that will allow you to type by looking at letters in, in a headset. So you could be fully immobile um, and not, not even be able to speak, but be able to communicate um, by simply looking at letters uh, on a screen and it will type for you. So, you know, these are really miraculous achievements. And I think a lot of them are being developed for people of all abilities, but will certainly be a benefit to, uh, to those who have a variety of disabilities 
So we're really encouraged by that. And we do try and bring these stories to um, lawmakers when we talk to them, because, I mean, really, some of these ideas seem like science fiction, but they're real. And, and this is being developed and hopefully will be in people's hands within the next few years. So that's, a, you know, we, we try and convey that message of optimism. And I'll, I'll try to add to that. Yes, I agree. A lot of people, uh, you know, uh, who don't necessarily have a disability at the moment uh, could have one in the future and the benefits of these technologies and helping, you know, broader swath than just what we think about uh, at, at the moment is important. There's also, I, I think, sort of a, a case around if VR, AR technologies allow uh, certain people with disabilities to better leverage their skills uh, in ways that they might not be able to otherwise. There's kind of a business case uh, in terms of economic growth and uh, sort of more job opportunities. Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking a hypothetical example in my head, someone who uh, may uh, have a physical disability due to age, uh, have a hard time sort of uh, coming into the office, uh, taking meetings and stuff like that. If VR enables them to leverage the managerial skill they've developed over the uh, years uh, they've been working, uh, you know, so far, uh, that could be of great value to not just the person themselves, uh, but pe uh, organizations that might have lacked the management capacity to manage a, say, 10-person team. Uh, so those people who might be otherwise left without a good manager could, could have access uh, to sort of managerial talent that might have been underappreciated uh, otherwise. Uh, hopefully that sort of uh, makes sense and... Uh, that's kind of the thing. I, I come from our economics background and often like uh, gaps in talent, finding ways to plug them is something that can benefit sort of a broader uh, swath of population, not just the person. Um, and if technology enables that, I think that's, uh, you know, a strong case uh, to be made uh, for both policymakers and industry when it comes to thinking about the technologies and the accessibility issues uh, that are out there. Yeah, and I would point you to a paper that I think was previously shared in the Slack channel that XRA did with Pete um, that highlighted the importance of um, accessibility tools in creating business value, closing the skills gap, um, and creating inclusive employment and work opportunities. And there's some really great resources in there, um, and the document can certainly be uh, used as an education tool with lawmakers and, and other policy stakeholders. Thank you, Miranda. Yeah, I just reposted that in the Slack, uh, that white paper. And Larry, I see uh, you have your hand raised. <laughs> yeah, th I had a point that relates to that last question about state and local as well. I had a really fascinating conversation with the head of the Program Innovation Office in uh, Tennessee for the Department of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. And they are very much focusing on technology first to serve both the client base that they have and the 10 times as many that they can't serve that don't have Medicare waivers or Medicaid um, or haven't applied, that their funding is relatively limited. So they really want to bring technology into the mix for the client base. And they really wanna lean into virtual reality to help them uh, save money. So one of the arguments being made uh, in addition to all the others is Limited funding means you've got to lean into technology to serve that client base that you just can't serve otherwise. And I did put a link to that office in the Slack channel. Thank you, Larry. Excellent point. Um, so yeah, again, encourage everyone to continue to ask questions. Um, one to consider, uh, nothing about us without us is an essential disability rights slogan. Um, panelists, what actions are needed to ensure that people with disabilities become directly involved in the design of immersive technologies? Yeah, uh, and of course, how can both government and industry uh, assist with that? Yeah, I can jump in uh, on sort of the policy side, maybe talk a bit about the industry mm -hmm. side. Uh, one of the things that I uh, have seen in technology policy in my you know, a few years in the uh, space uh, has been the importance of multi-stakeholder approaches. 
uh, to both designing standards, frameworks, best practices, government policy, uh, regulation law. So from government's perspective and industry's perspective, I think it's important for them to talk to, again, diverse range of stakeholders, uh, you know, from a variety of communities, including uh, people with disabilities and even within the uh, people with disabilities, uh, you know, uh, groups, uh, they, there's diversity itself, like people have different types of uh, disabilities that they're dealing with. Uh, one of the things that could really help uh, people like myself in think tanks is uh, suggestions on the right people to reach out to who are uh, people in the space and sort of a diverse range of uh, advocacy, advocacy groups, but also just individual people. Because uh, I think it's important uh, in order to get people's voices heard, uh, it's important for uh, decision makers or uh, think tanks, uh, other organizations in this space to uh, figure out who the right people are and anything you guys can do to make our life easier or make sure we uh, haven't left any stone unturned uh, can be uh, very, very helpful. Uh, I'll also go back to the uh, issue of it's important to have a diverse range of uh, you know people in terms of backgrounds, viewpoints when designing, deploying, developing, uh, testing uh, various technologies. Uh, any you know techniques for uh, improving diversity in the workforce uh, for people with disabilities or other groups, uh, I think is, is is a critical component of getting uh, this this. Uh, uh, issue uh, sort of like addressed in a very uh, meaningful way. Uh, so these, these are challenging uh, issues. Uh, I think we need more collaboration uh, with this reporting. And we, we were hoping to start a conversation uh, on this topic that went beyond just your traditional uh, Washington DC based stakeholder groups, because that, that's, that's not adequate uh, for tackling these issues. We need you know, a broad swath of uh, the uh, population, both people who are using the technology, people who will be affected by the technology uh, to sort of give their input. And again, we, we think it's important for people uh, to be well informed about the issues so they can give us the best input given the uh, diversity of life experiences and the uh, backgrounds they've had. Uh, I'll see if Joan or Miranda have uh, more to say from industry's perspective. No, I mean, I think that was you covered the gamut there. I was just going to say, I think that there are some examples out there in other areas of emerging tech that could show us how we could build some of those collaborations that you were talking about, John. So there was a uh, National Advisory Committee on AI that was established um, that brings together industry, um, you know, civil society, academics, and government stakeholders um, to advise the, this current administration on its AI policy, acknowledging that um, you know XR is is even more <laughs> nascent than AI. I think that something like that would be really helpful in this space and help to establish best pra best practices for how we can ensure that we are including diverse perspectives at all levels of the technology stack and then all, at all levels of policy development as well, because it's not just on the uh, tech development side, but it's also on the policy development side for how that tech will be regulated. If I can jump back and one more point, which I think I made earlier, I want to make again, uh, technology is moving pretty rapidly uh, beyond existing policies. And I think this challenge is getting harder. Again, it's sort of a subjective sense of how quickly technology is moving. It's, it's very hard to measure that, uh, but I think people need to be proactive in this space. And again, this, this is why uh, conversations like these, I think are very important and finding ways to get, you know, the right people, more people, a diverser range of people uh, in the room and discussing these issues is very important. And I would just add to, uh, to sort of wrap everything up on this question that XRA has published a, uh, a chapter of our developer's guide um, chapter three, and it's available um, through our website, and it's specifically on accessibility and you know, um, inclusive design. So we're, you know, we're strong advocates about uh, thinking about accessibility as part of the design process rather than looking to make retrofits. Um, so hopefully the the guide um, is helpful to people, but it's you know it's targeted at developers. So when they're 
starting their process, this is something that is foundational to what they're doing. Thank you, John. And I just reposted that in, um, in, in the Slack channel. Um, so I, we have a few questions. Um, Ed, I think you were first. Um, you asked in the Slack channel, given that many decisions are made around numbers, I, I was curious what number related to XR access resonates the most with elected officials? That's a, a good question. Um, having worked in <laughs> congressional office myself, I would say that far and away the number that um, attracts most attention is job and employment opportunities within their state or district. Um, and so if you can get that specific um, data, that's great. Um, you know, us at XRA have um, struggled to identify that because the industry is so nation nascent at the moment. Um, but certainly highlighting, um, you know, universities that are active in this space, um, you know, civil society groups, things like that um, are very important. Um, investment, um, you know, contribution to, to GDP, all of those are kind of the, the data points that are interesting to, to lawmakers. Um, you know, unfortunately, some of those don't exist yet. <laughs> um, but, you know, working together to try and identify those. Um, and if there's not qualitative data, then quantitative data um, will have to suffice for the moment, I think. Uh, I, I uh, just want to point out, I thought I had an economics bias, uh, but I was, I was going to say something similar, just given that economics background, I actually printed out the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, information on uh, persons with a disability. This is one of the things I've kind of been reviewing to sort of help uh, better understand uh, the issues. Because uh, if you can show ways that XR technologies can be leveraged uh, when it comes to sort of uh, creating jobs uh, and opportunity, I, I think that uh, at least would resonate with me. And I have not worked on Capitol Hill myself, except an internship way back in the day. Uh, but economic uh, statistics, I think, are an important piece of this puzzle. And for uh, you know rural uh, communities, I would say how the technology can be leveraged to increase access to education and access to healthcare as well. Those are two um, essential government services, and so any information on that uh, would always be welcome from congressional offices. Thank you, uh, Scott. I see you have a question. Yeah, it was more of a comment um, earlier, hopefully it's still relevant, is the, when folks were talking about looking at the AI as the way as far as different stakeholder groups and success, especially disability access to the forefront. I would also say some of the success that that's happened also in the automated vehicle space was really helpful on that too, is the coalitions, a lot of the advisory work, a lot of the collaboration and, and not to say it was self promotion maybe is that I was involved with some of that work all the way back in 2018 and 2019 that uh, I think that might also help inform here in addition to AI as far as the success of making sure that folks were emphasizing not only at the forefront but also diverse types of disabilities too because um, I think especially uh, cognitive for instance gets left out that there's benefits from sensory there's benefits from physical but also cognitive and I'm, I was glad that yesterday that the conference is mentioning neurodiversity for instance and cognitive because you know I, I think that folks don't necessarily see that there's benefits across many different types of uh, disabilities but um, you know I think I can share resources later on if that's helpful I'll see if I can pull up anything I can put it in the slack channel as far as different things in that automated vehicle space that might be helpful for informing how accessibility was put at the forefront and inclusive design universal design was emphasized there um, in that space and had a lot of success resonating with the US Department of Transportation among other folks. Scott thank you. Um, I, Amy I see you also have a comment. Hi, yes, um, I also work for the Department of Labor Office of Disability Employment Policy with Scott. Um, I'm a statistician there. I would love to hear you elaborate a little bit on the role that research and statistics about the way that technology impacts people's life outcomes should look. Um, I work a lot with different kinds of BLS and census data, 
Um, and we, we paid really close attention to those labor force statistics about people with disabilities. And of course, lots of social and economic and cultural forces impact those numbers. So I'm curious, like what, what would research look like that would isolate how a technology like XR actually relates to somebody's life outcomes, like their ability to access healthcare. Um, like, are we talking about, or, or their ability to access employment, obviously. Um, like, are we talking about literally giving people technology and then asking them, how did this change your life? Like, is anybody doing something like that? Or um, literally giving it to employers and asking if it's made it easier for them to train people? You know, like, what, what research is out there that's actually connecting these outcomes to the technology? And how do you all think it should look? Yeah, I'm not sure if that question is directed at me, but I, I can uh, take a sort of stab at it. So a few broad points. Uh, one is that, you know, as researchers, we love data. We always think the more data, the better. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's one of the biases that's out there. But as you mentioned also, uh, data has to be properly contextualized uh, in terms of sort of like what it actually means, what it says, sort of how it was collected, because uh, there are often issues with data that are not obvious when you're looking at it at a high level uh, in terms of uh, what it actually means. Like uh, labor force participation rate is uh, sort of uh, people who are employed or actively looking for work. Uh, and then there's questions around, well, actively looking for work, like what, what does that exactly mean? Is, are we using a meaningful way of collecting it? Uh, someone who's worked on economic statistics in the past, uh, they often change uh, sort of uh, how data is collected or what, what approach they take to it. Uh, given we've lived through a pan or we're living through a pandemic right now, that can have a great effect on uh, how the data that's collected or what the data that's collected means, because maybe certain people are less likely to respond uh, based on sort of their existing li living situation relative to say three, four years ago. Uh, then in terms of your point about uh, sort of research on technology uh, broadly, uh, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to tease out the effects a technology has uh, on certain outcomes because it's hard to control for a variety of factors. Like we, we won't live in a world where virtual reality exists and one that doesn't exist that's perfectly compatible because it's just a fluid world out there. Uh, so research design around that is uh, tricky. Uh, that said, the research I look into on uh, technology policy just at a very broad level uh, often focuses on issues such as how long does it take for a technology uh, to be adapted and actually have meaningful effects on, say, productivity. Again, I, I look at economic issues. Uh, there's a famous paper uh, that sort of talks about uh, this thing known as the productivity paradox, uh, where the joke is, and may maybe this touches on some of your points, that uh, this was regarding the information technology re revolution. Uh, you can see the information technology revolution everywhere, but the productivity statistics that's, that's kind of the line that a Nobel Prize winner used. Uh, I, I think I slightly misquoted that. I forgot if it was, uh, you can see the information technology or the computer uh, world or something like that, the, everywhere with the productivity statistics. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's tricky. And then trying to figure out, well, why, why hasn't computing and uh, information technology actually showed up uh, in productivity has a variety of uh, sort of like potential explanations. Maybe we're not measuring productivity correctly. Uh, maybe it is slow to uh, diffuse throughout society uh, because it requires a correct infrastructure to be built around the new technology. Businesses have to figure out the right business model around it. Uh, workers have to train around it or at least train around complementary skills to the technology. Uh, so that stuff is very tricky. So researchers are trying to figure out uh, ways to sort of tease out the effect of technology uh, on certain outcomes, uh, whether it's for the accessibility community, whether it's for productivity statistics and all that. Uh, and there's no easy, easy solution. I'm happy to talk to you more uh, after this uh, sort of 
discussion um, if you want, but yeah, it's, it's a rough, rough, tricky challenge. Um, I'll see if Joan or Miranda want to add to that or if they have thoughts or if I answered your uh, question correctly. Uh, and I, I'm not sure who asked that. I think it was you, Amy, correct? Yeah, if you, if you have anything else to say, feel, feel free to do so. Yeah, thanks. Great answer. Um, I think like the, the productivity example is like a, a good, it seems to me like a good example of like a more like population wide measure yeah. um, and kind of like divorce from people's life outcomes or their well being. I mean, I think that's the challenge. So, yeah, I mean, you also alluded to the accessibility community. Um, and so I, I'd love to hear if other folks have research ideas in that area. I, I don't have research ideas um, off the top of my head, but I would uh, be very happy to connect you with um, our colleague, Stephanie Montgomery, who handles research and best practices um, for XRA. Uh, that's, her, that's her mission within our organization. So um, if you'd like, shoot me an email and I can, um, I can put you in touch. Sure, thank you. Sounds good, and I can help connect you as well. Uh, Ed, would you like to comment? Yeah, if it's okay, um, I, I don't know a, a lot about like the different numbers, but I, I have, like I work in education and technology. And uh, one thing I've, I've heard a lot was specifically with the neurodiverse uh, students, uh, it was about creativity, right? So a lot of, there was high outcomes for creativity, uh, which was connected to entrepreneurship. Uh, for those neurodiverse students. And I remember like the the keynote, the TED talk that Elon Musk did, and he talked about um, his experiences growing up with, uh, I believe it was Asperger's. Um, and I, I wondered like how many, I think the CDC says there's like 5 million people, you know, with similar types of conditions in the United States. So how many Elon Musks are we not enabling by not enabling this type of economic outcome? Uh, like giving them the types of tools, giving them the things that make it easier for them to to thrive. He was lucky. He had a family that could support him. Not everybody is like that. And I, I feel like that's really like a key message that I heard was one connected to look at most of your entrepreneurs. Um, I remember there was a made with dyslexia. They've done some stuff in the UK as well. Um, and and they said that like a lot of the your entrepreneurs, your your leading actors, great artists, um, they they're all the the neurodiverse type. And if you look at the key skill needed in the current economy, uh, it's all related to to that. And getting those voices in seems to be the thing that that's helping companies like thrive and separate themselves from uh, all the other companies that are out there. Um, yeah, I, I can comment and then turn it over to my colleagues. But uh, I, I think you raise a really good point about neurodiversity and um, that that's not always a disadvantage. You know, there are things that are challenges and things that are assets. Um, and neurodiversity in and of itself is not necessarily a negative. Um, I have a friend who has Asperger's and he has so many incredible cognitive talents that I, it's like magic to me. Um, one, seriously, one of the things he can do is you tell him your birthday and a year, what year it was, and he will tell you instantly what day of the week it was. I have no idea how his mind works like that. It's incredible. Uh, but he does struggle a lot with um, interpersonal communication. You know, he, he's very awkward and people don't know uh, necessarily that he has Asperger's and just think he's strange or difficult to, to communicate with. Um, so I think, you know, that's one of the... Uh, positives around XR is its um, application to treat, helping to treat people specifically who have are on the autism spectrum. Um, and there are applications there where someone can engage virtually in a social situation, which might give them anxiety or where they might not understand how to relate to someone and help to essentially, you know, train them uh, in the skills that they need to have positive social interactions. So I think, you know, that combined with their really special abilities um, can help to advance their career and, and their lives generally. So there's some really uh, very heartening stories out there and some great applications for people who are on the spectrum or have other uh, neurodiversity. Yeah, Joan, I'd love to um, pause there and give Scott a chance to comment. Scott? 
Yeah, um, I just wanted to jump in. So I'm autistic myself, uh, and I direct uh, a significant portion of what we do at ODEP around neurodiversity at work and national autism policy and our collaboration with our sister federal agencies. And I just wanted to mention also briefly that we have a research project on autism at ODEP. It's about $2 million. It launched last August. It's running for three years into, into 2024. And we will be having a listening session report that will be um, that listening session report will be coming out, um, I think, in the next few months that we had, I think it was like 96 uh, different uh, stakeholders in terms of autistic young adults, uh, youth and young adults, and like family members, service providers, policymakers, et cetera. And what I want to emphasize is the findings we're having from this project, they're not specific just to autism and neurodivergence, that they would apply, apply more broadly to other di different disability types that are meaningful, I think, here from the accessibility perspective. I often emphasize that a lot of what's helpful for empowering folks who are neurodivergent, including autistic people like myself and our stakeholders we interact with, is the uh, is helpful for other folks, too. And I just thought, just a brief mention, too, is that what was mentioned on that service provision on the intellectual developmental disability space is an overlap too, obviously for autistic folks and other folks with development disabilities is, um, I saw that in Pennsylvania too, on that service provision for autistic people and other folks with development disabilities that the, uh, the text access as far as uh, XR and AI, et cetera, and other emerging tech change is going to be helpful. I think, you know, just another plug toward serving a greater population group because only a very small portion are on the service systems like the Medicaid waivers, as was mentioned earlier, including autistic people. Like it's a, it's a very small portion. And a lot of folks, uh, the tech change and other tools and resources could just be so a uh, such benefit for having that boost. Sometimes folks just need a small boost to have their greater opportunities as far as employment in the workforce and community living, education, et cetera. And so I think that's something we can stress here too. I think on the policy of practices is even, even what seems like sometimes a small impact as far as greater access for folks for being able to make use of these tools and tech change in XR can have just great benefits as far as quality of life and health and wellness for folks. And that crossover to, to employment and social determinant of health on that. So um, I, I think sometimes some folks may perceive certain impacts or certain excess uh, changes as being small or moderate when they are big for folks lives you know it's real people that this is impacting so thank you scott um so i mean kind of relatedly especially given last year's executive order on deia in the federal government uh, what potential does xr offer to foster inclusion for people with disabilities including people who are multiply marginalized I, I can go first. Yes. Yeah, so I think one of the uh, interesting things is how different people learn things differently uh, based on both, you know, uh, the circumstances they're in, sort of their background, you know, how they think and how they operate. Uh, I think XR technologies, again, with the right R&D or research or sort of like a techniques and all that can help identify uh, ways uh, for people to learn, people to work, uh, people to interact with others uh, that could really help uh, when it comes to sort of some of these equity and inclusion issues if done right. And we don't yet know fully what works, what doesn't work. I don't want to be Pollyannish on the technology when we need a lot of uh, R&D uh, and sort of pilot programs, you know, experimentation to figure out what works. That's one thing I often sort of try to point to. Another, and I was talking to a, a nonprofit where uh, they were connecting people, I believe it was in the LGBTQ community, uh, using virtual reality so they could uh, mm -hmm. interact uh, with each other, especially for people who might be in a more like uh, isolated part of the country where they have a hard time. Okay. Uh, reaching out to people. I think within the accessibility community, uh, there's potential for that. People aren't already doing that to connect people uh, with each other, uh, especially since you said people who are, I think the term was multiply marginalized. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you, you might be uh, fairly uh, unique in one sense uh, in your region, but if you get the global population, 
you might be able to connect people with people who are more than you. Uh, and, and in my in my uh, view, uh, sometimes the idea of someone who's uh, you know older than you or has had more experience uh, in dealing with some of the issues that are unique to your circumstances, I, I think that could be a really uh, good opportunity. Uh, so again, when you have a broader population of the globe that you can access in sort of an immersive environment, uh, I, I think there's a lot of potential there that uh, needs to be explored. And again, I, I don't want to sound too Pollyannish. We need to figure out what works, what doesn't work, but I think that's a opportunity that uh, some people are exploring. Uh, and you know, I, I think there's a lot of potential there. Absolutely. Um, yeah, in terms of other questions, um, you know, we'd love to go back to that priority uh, you mentioned in the report for examining existing regulation. I'm just kind of curious if you're watching any area in particular. I know um, one early case that I'm aware of that just came up this spring arose uh, in the federal court in the Western District of New York. Uh, and a man who's deaf brought a case against HTC because the company did not include captioning in their VR content. And so the case uh, is related to the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's still in progress, but the judge is allowing the case to proceed based on past rulings regarding the ADA and technology. So curious if you have thoughts on that or uh, other issues or regulations like the CVAA or, or anything in particular. Sure. Well, I think that the case in itself highlights the need for policymakers, industry, civil society um, to kind of do a gap analysis and under mm -hmm. take a layered approach and understand where do existing anti-discrimination laws already cover XR technologies and where do they not? And as with all emerging tech, um, you know, the existing laws will be tested in the court. Um, and so it'll be really interesting to see how, how this turns out. Um, and I know that just this past March, the Department of Justice issued guidance um, basically saying that the uh, ADA applies to um, websites um, under public accommodations. And so things like that, I think will slowly um, and incrementally move the ball forward. Um, but it's also kind of on all of us to, you know, issue, uh, yeah, uh, raise flags of the issues that we see, um, you know, and, it, and it's not just in, um, you know, anti-discrimination and accessibility, um, you know, we're also lacking a, a comprehensive data privacy law. Um, and so that's <laughs> certainly a, a gaping hole, um, I would say, for the, the industry as well. Um, John, I don't know if you wanted to, to hop in and, and add anything else. Yeah, no, I, I think those are all uh, great points. And that when you mentioned what's one you're falling at, the data privacy stuff, uh, you know, recently new legislation has been uh, sort of introduced on that topic. So I think that's a hot button one. Uh, you know, I, my advice to policymakers often is, uh, you know, when you think of data, uh, think of how data is going to evolve uh, with new technologies. What we consider data is going to, you know, probably be different um, in uh, the coming years. Uh, different types of data are going to be out there, including ones that don't exist right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so making sure policymakers are adequately informed uh, about some of the technical aspects and how it affects, you know, broader communities, including people in the accessibility community, I think is uh, critical. Uh, and just back to the point I was making about what, what some call the pacing problem, I think as emerging technology comes, uh, I again subjectively think it's a, at a faster pace right now, and that's going to raise a lot more uh, policy issues and challenges, and we, we need to do whatever we can to get uh, policymakers up to speed. Yeah, and I think that also doing that through um, tech neutral uh, laws and provisions so that they can be future proofed because um, we can't keep, you know, revisiting these. I mean, the rate, the uh, rate of Congress and rate of change is, is not very fast. Um, mm -hmm. And so if we can kind of embed um, best practices that will account for all the ways that technology will develop, um, you know, in the future that could potentially create a better found, uh, policy foundation. Yeah, and, and something that both the 
privacy discussion and the accessibility discussion have in common. Um, when you think about this H HTC case that's been brought um, and numerous lawsuits uh, on the basis of uh, failure to protect privacy, you know, it makes business sense to for developers and companies to be thinking about these things uh, proactively and to be thinking about accessibility by design and privacy by design, because while it might um, take more time and more thought and more money um, on the front end of things, it will inevitably save money on the back end of things if, if uh, they don't have to deal with lawsuits. And also even just from an engineering standpoint, going back in and reformulating how a technology uh, operates to include privacy and accessibility. So, I mean, it's the right thing to do, um, but it also, I think, uh, hits the bottom line and makes sense. Thank you so much. Yeah, the data privacy is itself such an important inclusion um, consideration given that people with disabilities uh, are particularly vulnerable to data and privacy breaches. Yeah. Um, so we are starting to wrap up. We've got about five minutes left. So um, participants, if you have additional questions, please raise them now. Um, but for now, uh, you know, Miranda had brought the question um, previously just to us, but uh, we're curious to get your feedback on what you'd like to see policymakers do to incentivize inclusive design and whether or not uh, your organizations have ever been part of government funded research on technology and accessibility. So curious, uh, just generally for the audience, um, do you have any feedback on what you'd like to see from policymakers? Yeah, I'll take the second half and then make it uh, lead to the first half. Uh, so we have not gotten government funding uh, for R&D in uh, accessibility, at least in the context of XR. I don't know at the broader organization. I think that's uh, true for the broader organization as well. That said, you know, I mean, if BPC approves and the uh, government wants to fund research on the topic, I think it's <laughs> of, of, you know, of great value. Uh, in terms of specific uh, types of R&D projects in this space. Yes, so, so I, I do think pilot programs often have a lot uh, they can teach us. And if the government uh, is trying to sort of uh, promote a certain uh, policy, uh, you know, issue uh, to really, really understand it, I think they can play a big role. Uh, so I, you know, find that uh, very uh, useful. I mentioned, I think, earlier that oftentimes uh, addressing the issue ahead of time can help us more long term by making sure that uh, the technology is inclusive. So I think any research at the early stage uh, where the government can complement uh, what industry is doing or nudging industry, because uh, if the government does a lot of the R&D uh, to help promote more inclusive design, that is lower cost for the industry, at least in theory, uh, further incentivizing them to do more. Uh, so that's kind of my initial reaction uh, to this. I'd have to think a bit more about specific uh, research questions uh, and like where the government is sort of best suited uh, to fund it. Yeah, I mean, and I'm also curious about the role government can play through procure its procurement dollars um, and establishing uh, best practices. And I mean, there's that's been done across a number of different industries and, and use cases, cybersecurity is, is one that, that comes to mind um, immediately, but would be interested to know if there's anything um, on the accessibility front there that we should be looking at. And if I can ask, uh, I'm curious if anyone has any good examples of sort of government R&D addressing uh, accessibility questions uh, in other technologies. If you have examples of that, uh, feel free to put in Slack or you can email me uh, after the event, my email's on the website. Uh, I, I think that's an interesting question. Looking at past precedent is one of the things I try to do uh, when it comes to technology, because, you know, uh, from our founding as a country, you know, there's been new technologies and people trying to address a lot of the questions we're asking today, just in a different iteration. Oh, Larry. Yeah. The entire history of closed captioning, video description for the blind, all government funded, every bit of it. Really? Wow. Okay. Uh, web accessibility had early funding from NSF. Um, 
almost all the accessibility of mainstream technology had government funding. And XR needs some now too. Is there a good source where they uh, sort of compile a lot of these examples? I would love to find one in your head. Maybe you should write a paper and uh, you know share it with us. You didn't hear I'm retired now. Uh, but yes, that's one of the kind of things I'd like to work on. All right. Well, I think that's a good note to end on. Um, so thank you all so much, both panelists and participants, for this excellent discussion. Um, I learned a lot, and I hope you did too. So um, of course, we've got, if anyone has any final, final questions, but I think uh, we're good to, to close the conversation. Um, but that doesn't mean it has to end completely. Uh, the deep dive chan A2 channel will remain live, so we can certainly con continue the conversation in Slack. And again, that channel is deep dive dash a2 dash policy and people <clears throat> have been posting a wealth of links and resources there so it's a great way to continue to learn uh, and engage on these issues. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you everyone. everyone. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. <laughs>